every person who becomes a member of Living Hope Community Church has to do an interview with one of the past senior uh, leaders or one of the elders. I love doing membership interview because I get to meet people of all walks of life, uh, all different experiences. They bring their pains with them, their, their dreams, and we get to talk about a lot of that. I love doing that. And I, I, when we talk about their spiritual background, I hear a lot of different types of stories. One of the most common stories is they've grown up in the church and there's a junior high camp. I don't know why junior junior high camps are such a meaningful time. They went to a junior high camp and there was a campfire and they accepted Jesus. Um, they also tell me that, and then they left the church for a long time because of hurts or college or whatever, and that now they're back. Another common uh, story that I hear is that um, at Living Hope is the first church they've ever gone to. And this is all they know, and they think all churches are like this. And I've had times, and in the membership interview, I've led people to Jesus Christ because they haven't really heard what the gospel is. I've also had uh, people who've uh, been leaders in their uh, churches, uh, whether it be uh, as an elder or a deacon uh, or former pastors who are now saying, you know, this is where I want to settle down at. Uh, another group of people that I meet with I have a thing in the Korean word, uh, term, it's mote shinang, and it's uh, literally um, faith from the mother's womb. So they've grown up in the church, they, they've always been in the church, they, and they don't remember a time when they didn't believe in Jesus Christ. And regardless of whatever background they come from, one of the things I try to do is really understand, do they have an understanding of the gospel? Or do they have a form of cultural Christianity or functional moralism? Um, so do they have a relationship with Jesus Christ or do they simply have the title of Christianity? Or do they think that because they've done certain things uh, that they are a Christian? And being a member really is one of those things. You know, um, this whole section of the book of Romans, um, Paul is, is making a case against the, the people saying, uh, before I can give you the good news, I have to tell you the bad news. Before I, I tell you that you can be saved through faith, I have to tell you that you are lost in your sins. So in chapter 1, verses 18 through 32, Paul made a case for those who embraced sin, uh, whether it be immorality or idolatry. But in the end, we were told that we are uh, the sinners. And in chapter 2, verses 1 through 16, Paul made a case against those who trusted in their goodness. In the end, we realized that our goodness actually condemns us. And today, we are in chapter 2, verse 17 to chapter 3, verse 8, and Paul is going to make a case against those who trust in their religion. And if you are here today, and if you have been attending church for a while, and so can I, can I ask um, a show of hands, and you know, like I know we're all shy, but how many of you have been attending church for over five years, not living hope, just, but just church in general? How many of you have been attending church for five years or more? Okay. Like, this is a vast majority of you. Okay, put your hands down. And, and the rest of you have been attending church less than five years or you're too distracted so you didn't raise your hand, right? <laughs> For those of us who have been attending church a long time, who identify themselves as Christians, who have been involved in many different ways, there is a danger in us trusting in Christianity apart from Christ. There is a danger that we've fallen into a functional moralism rather than a, a genuine relationship. There is a danger in us having embraced a, relig a religion and, and having that become a, our God. And so in this particular passage that we're on today, Paul is going to make a case against the religious, and he's going to confront us with um, 
how we trust in our morality and how we trust in our religion. And then he's going to answer some objections. So if you have not done so yet, would you turn your Bibles with me to Romans chapter 2, verse 17. Romans chapter 2, verse 17. And he's going to talk to the moralist side of us. And we know that that's what he's going to do because he begins chapter 17 by saying, but if you call yourself a Jew. So he's going to identify the religious moralist by laying out uh, the resumes of the moralist or the religious moralist. And, 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 and today's message is going to be, we're just kind of, kind of going to just go through the Bible, right? So in verse 17, but if you call yourself a Jew, and if we are understanding this in our context, if you check the box on the survey and tell others that you are a Christian, if you rely on the law, if you put your dependence on the Bible, that's the book for you. You stand alone on the word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. If that's you, if you... Um, uh, boast in God, if you unashamedly sing of your relationship with God, if you know his will, you have a certain insight on the heart of God, if you approve uh, the things that are excellent or superior, you have the ability to discern what is best from what is good. If you are instructed by the law, you have become a listener of some of the best uh, preachers across the country because you listen to podcasts. If you are convinced that you can instruct others, you have become competent enough that you have become a teacher of the law, that you lead a cell group or you lead a small group in, in KKC or, or in Halipult. If you have the embodiment in the law uh, of knowledge and truth, if you possess what really matters. This is a picture of the moralist. Now, um, uh, Tim Keller makes an, a, a, like a profound kind of a statement, and I want you to look up on the screen, and I, sometimes we understand things better not only when we listen to it, but when we w look at it. There's not much difference between the words morality and moralism, but there is an eternal world of difference between making a good thing, morality, into your God, moralism. Okay. I want that to sink in a little bit. We think that morality and moralism is kind of the same, but he says there's a difference between seeking what is merely good, morality, and somehow making that my God. And we know that we have done that or we have become functional moralists when we brag about or at least have pride in the good things that we have done and believing that that somehow makes me more attractive to God, acceptable to God. That when we rely on our own actions, professions, and identity, and when we do that, we have joined uh, the biggest religion in the world. Listen, we, uh, the, Christianity is not the biggest religion in the world. Islam is not the biggest religion in the world. Uh, it's not any of the Eastern religions that's the biggest religion in the world. The biggest religion in the world is moralism. It crosses all religion. Moralism basically says that if I am good enough, regardless of whatever uh, we define as good, moralism says that I trust in my goodness to make me good enough. And even as Christians... Functionally, we can become moralist. Even when we have accepted Christ uh, by uh, the basis of grace, believing the gospel, the longer we're in the church, the more we get involved, the more moral we become, we somehow can slide into a functional moralism. Paul then goes after the moralist and our hypocrisy. Verses 21 through 24, then you who teach others, you who preach against stealing, you who say one must not commit adultery, 
you who abhor idols, you who boast in the law. And he's not saying that, um, that all of those things are bad. In fact, no, those are right and virtuous. That we should hold on to all of those teachings and values. But he counters to each one of those. You who teach others, do you not teach yourself? If you, uh, you teach catapult students um, uh, biblical truth, but are you living that? You try to tell your kids to live according to scripture, but are you living it? You are adamant about uh, the sin of stealing, but do you not steal in your own ways, whether it be uh, taxes or time at work or uh, copyright laws? You point your fingers at those who lead alternate lifestyle, but do you not commit adultery in your mind with the things that you watch? You would never worship the statue of a Buddha, but do you not, do you not worship success and trophies? At least that's what we do with our kids. You say that you are a Bible believer, but do you not dishonor God by disobeying the exact Bible that we claim is the word of God and we honor? And how he concludes this particular paragraph is standing in verse 24. Look at it with me. For as it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. He says that the hypocrisy of the Jews was causing the Gentiles to disbelieve God and the hypocrisy of Christians today is causing the world, the, uh, the unchurched, to disbelieve God. You know, last week, if you remember, on Saturday, the big news was that a, a, a lone gunman went into a mosque when Muslims were worshiping and murdered 50 people. The ironic thing was that it occurred in the city of uh, Christ Church in New Zealand. And most people had the sense to be sympathetic and not say anything stupid. But let me ask you this question, and, and I'm going to get on, on a little bit of a um, Soapbox, and I don't get on soapboxes often with you. I try to be as nice as possible, but I'm going to get on my soapbox today, okay? So if, I've, if, I've, if you feel like, hey, Pastor Steve's talking about me, is he, yes, probably yes. <laughs> okay? If your community, whether it be uh, the non-Christian coworkers, classmates, uh, the people in your lives who don't go to church, whether it be family or neighbors or friends, or, or listen carefully, or those whom you call friends on Facebook, people whom you've had direct or indirect uh, impressions on, would they have thought that you would have genuinely grieved at the death of 50 Muslims in New Zealand? Or perhaps would they have thought about you from the direct and indirect dealings that they've had with you? Would they have possibly thought that there's a corner of your heart that would have said, this is justified? The Muslims, after all they've done, they've got some of this coming to them. Would your community, after having observed you through your snide remarks, your inflammatory social media posts, your Twitter reposting, is that correct? Do you repost Twitters? Okay. or through your mere indifference to those who are of different religion, 
different sexual orientation, different political leanings, different race, or different legal standings in our country, would they have assumed that you would have reacted with less than compassion? I want to say something to you. The reason why many non-Christians are not open to our message of the gospel, the reason why uh, they would look awkward when we give them a postcard from our church, the reason why uh, they may not be visiting the church that you attend is because of the way you carry yourself, the way that we carry ourselves. And the very fact that we hesitate even and saying to those same people, would you visit our church is because there's something in us that, has, that reminds us I haven't been acting lovingly to the people around my community. David Kinneman of the Barna Group did a three-year research pulling young, unchurched people to find out what they thought about Christians. The result, I mentioned this a couple of, week ago, couple of weeks ago, was published in a book called Unchristian. Non-Christian young people see Christians as, so this is what young people, millennials, think of you and me. They think of us as judgmental, hypocritical, anti-homosexual, too political, and, um, you know, too political, insensitive, and boring. I know, it's a, some, some, for some reason, we're most offended by boring, <laughs> right? And though we may think that the reason why non-Christians have this perspective of Christians is because how the, the media oftentimes portray the church, and there's an element to that, but in that survey, it says a shocking 50% of the non-Christian respondents said that their negative view of Christians was based upon their personal contacts with Christians. The conclusion is that many of those outside of Christianity reject Jesus because they feel rejected by Christians. The greatest hindrance of the gospel is not the incredible claims of Jesus, it's not the miracles in the Bible. It's not the, the morality of the message. The greatest hindrance of the, uh, to the Christian message is Christians. As one Huffington Post opinion writer insinuates, and, and take a look with me on the screen, the single greatest cause of atheism in America today is the hypocrisy of Christians. The single greatest cause of atheism in America today is the hypocrisy of Christians. And so Paul writes to the Christians, you who call yourself a Christian, what are you doing with your life? He talks now to the religious side of the same people and we know he's talking about those who are religious because in verse 25, for circumcision. And circumcision is the, the marker, the religious marker of the Jew. It, it was that particular marker that told the Jews that I am a, a part of the covenant family, recipient of God's grace. This is my ticket into heaven. And for the Jew, the world was divided into two groups of people, the circumcised and the uncircumcised. Those who are loved by God and those who God, whom God treated indifferently. Those who will end up in heaven and those who most likely will not end up in heaven. One rabbi commentated that Abraham would be at the entrance of hell and not allow any circumcised people to enter in. Every religion has a marker that divides insiders from outsiders, the external markers that we in the church probably use is that of baptism and possibly church membership. 
and it is how we kind of distinguish, at least outwardly, Christians from non-Christians. But verses 25 talks about such markers. For circumcision is indeed of value if you obey the law, but if you break the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. Your marker becomes not a marker. Verse 26, so if a man who is uncircumcised keeps the precepts of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? Then he who is physically uncircumcised but keeps the law will condemn you who have the written code and circumcision but break the law. If you have the marker but act like someone who doesn't have the marker, but if you act like someone and live like someone who has the marker but don't happen to have the marker. So if you act like, live like someone who loves God and, and follow him as opposed to someone who says that they are but don't live and love like someone who is a follower of Jesus Christ. What is that? Verses 28 and 29 for no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical, but a Jew is one inwardly. And circumcision is a matter of the heart by the spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. And the point that Paul is making is this. External markers are, are supposed to merely show what's on the inside. External markers don't dictate what's on the inside. You know, um, some 27 um, years ago, I, I was married, and like many of you, on the day of my wedding, um, my wife and I exchanged rings. And if you think about uh, those of you who are engaged or married, rings are uh, in some ways an immensely impractical piece of property, right? Uh, men are somehow blackmailed into spending extraordinary amounts of money to buy a tiny piece of geology <laughs> um, that has artificially been inflated by the, who, what brothers? Some, some Jewish brothers, <laughs> right? And, and somewhere along the line, they've started like classifying the clarity, color, and, and certificate. And so exchange rings, and you know what I think, it is, it is immensely impractical, and on the wedding day, instead of exchanging rings, I think really a more practical gift would be, and would the groom and the bride exchange eye watches at this time? Right? And, and these eye watches that you would give to each other would be renewed um, every time they come up with a new version of uh, the eye watch. It's a lifetime guarantee. And they're synced with each other. So at the end of the day, you come home and you bam, you know. <laughs> How was your day? Boom, here it is, honey. All, everything that I've done, that, that sounds wonderful, right? It's a great marketing scheme. But instead, we exchange rings. And you know what's horrible about a ring? Um, is that one day, you know, and almost every married couple that I know, every bride and every groom goes through this, at some time during your life, you have this horrible, horrible moment. It's like, oh my God, where is my ring? <laughs> right? And I can tell by the look in your eyes, those of you who've had that moment. You know, and, and you feel like, okay, I've lost my ring. Where is it? It's that ring that he gave me. It's that ring that she gave me. Uh, and I made my vows that day that I will never lose this. I mean, I can, like, I can, I can like, kill my dog, but I can't, like, lose my ring, you know? It's, like, that bad, right? One day, I thought I lost my ring. Uh, I mean, I was here, and at uh, the end of the day, my ring, I don't know where it was. Um, I, I was looking for it for days. I asked everyone at the office, uh, I, asked, I asked the custodian, did you see my ring? I was looking at the trash and everywhere, you know, that, um, and you know, a few days later, I finally just you know, got the courage to tell my wife, I can't find my ring. My wife can find anything, right? I can't find my ring. Um, it, you know, it was, it was somewhere, somehow hidden inside my briefcase somewhere. Um, but you know, um, if you think about the ring, the wedding ring, 
the wedding ring doesn't cause someone to be married, right? The wedding ring is merely an external symbol to signify that you're married. A married person is still just as married if they lose the ring or if, it, if they don't. And a person who buys a, a, a $5 piece of ring, if they just put it on their finger, it doesn't mean that they're married now. And what Paul is trying to say is circumcision or baptism or church membership is nothing. Our religion is nothing if it's not a symbol of what's happening inside. What's happening inside is what matters. By the way, baptism on Easter, I don't want you to think that it's bad, <laughs> right? So, you know, guys, get the ring. I don't want to, you know, like I don't want to get in trouble later on and don't lose your ring. So baptism is important. Baptism coming up in Easter. Okay, let's go on to the next. Now, if morality and religion were, were so unimportant, then the theoretical Jew begins raising some objections. And there are three objections that he's going to answer in chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. Three questions, three questions. The first objection is this. What good is religion then? What good is religion? Verse 1 of chapter 3. What, uh, then what advantage has the Jew or what is the value of circumcision? What good is being a covenant People having the law and being circumcised, if none of those things guarantee heaven, what practical advantage are these things? And Paul says in verse 2, much in every way to begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. He said there are various uh, blessings, advantage, value of being religious or uh, having, given, having been given the law or circumcision. You possess a special revelation that others do not. It is a great privilege and responsibility. But the problem is that the Jews have uh, Jews thought that the law itself, having been um, a, a, a covenant people, was a mere privilege. They should have known that they were uh, a part of a kingdom of priests, given the word of God, set apart that they could be a light to the nation. It was not only a privilege, but a responsibility because they were entrusted with the oracles of God. You know what? I'm, I'm not a doctor. Um, I um, determined when I was in junior high school, um, and I guess all Asians at one point in time think that they should be a doctor, but I, in junior high school, I realized I could not stand the sight of blood. Uh, I knew very, you know, early on I couldn't be a doctor, but I have lots of doctor people in my family, my wife's family, um, friends, and here at our church. Um, and also, we have a boatload of uh, healthcare professionals. If you're ever going to get hurt, this is the place to get hurt. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm not kidding. I, um, you know, uh, those in, in, in the medical profession have a unique set of knowledge. You know pathology, you know what gets someone sick, and, and you know what can help someone get better. You have a unique set of knowledge that is both a privilege and a responsibility. But doctors aren't always, although they have the knowledge, the most healthiest segment of the population. And, you know, isn't it strange that a, a cardiologist or a, 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 a heart doctor who could have been, who was trained at some of the finest institution uh, can, all, can have a heart attack just like the regular population? And so if a cardiologist with all of his training or all of her training can have a heart attack, uh, the, the objection by the family members maybe, so what good is knowing all of that? Well, first of all, knowing doesn't guarantee doing, right? 
uh, and, and doctors and healthcare professionals are sometimes the worst patients. But what Paul is saying is this, to begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. The reason why healthcare professionals, you have this knowledge is not only can you apply that knowledge in your own life, but you have that knowledge, why? So that you can be life givers to others. You weren't given that knowledge to say, well, those sick people out there, I want to stay as far away from them as possible. But you were given that knowledge so that you can get in touch with them. You can be in contact with them. So you can have the sick people come to you. And so that you can apply that knowledge to give life. And that's what he's saying to the religious here. Sometimes what we do is we treat the word of God to make us feel like we're better than the sick people out there. When we are supposed to take that and say, how are we going to give life to them? The second objection is, is God good? Is God good? Verse three, what if some were unfaithful? Does their faithlessness nullify the faithful of God, and, and if you have to kind of understand big theology, God promised Abraham that you know your kids and their kids and their kids' kids will be a, 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 a you know, grand generation of covenant people. God made a promise to Moses, etc., to David, and and the rhetorical question is, well, if all of these Jews were are falling away from you, God, if they're rejecting you, then is God? Uh, um, goodness in question. Is God not keeping his promise? And verse four, by no means let God be true, though everyone were a liar as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. God's saying, no, no, no. Paul's saying, God is righteous and he will keep his promises, but not in the way sometimes we generalize. God will keep his promise to Abraham, Jacob, and Isaac, and David, and and Moses, and though individuals sometimes will reject, God's promise is still true and will come true and come to fruition through uh, Jesus. Final, um, the final objection, should we be blamed? Should we be blamed? Now, this is kind of a tricky objection, but look at verse 5. But if our unrighteousness serves to show the righteousness of God, what shall we say? That God is unrighteous to inflict wrath on us? I speak in a human way, and even Paul says this is such a ridiculous argument that I'm just saying, Paul is saying it's not legit, but let me tell you what some people are potentially thinking. And it is kind of a twisted objection, um, and you have to kind of really think about this. Um, if our unrighteousness t- serves to show the righteousness of God, so if we're bad, but God loves us anyway, and so it makes God look better and God's more glorified, then, hey, me being bad, that's actually good. Right? Does that make sense? No. Okay, let me, let me try this. A drunk driver cr- runs through a red light, slams into your car, you're in the hospital for a week, you go to trial, you're in the court, and you're facing the drunk driver, and and the love of God just like pours in your heart, and you see this person, and, and you say in your testimony, I, I want to forgive this person. Yes, I'm injured, and, and I suffered horribly, but I want to forgive. And the drunk driver uh, gets up in his testimony and says, uh, um, hey, um, uh, this person forgave me. And look at, look at all these people in the courtroom thinks that she's the most wonderful person in the world. And they're all looking at her and honoring her and glorifying her and, and applauding her in their heart. She has become a better person because what I've done. So 
Really, Judge, my drunk driving has made her better. Why should I be found guilty for the good that I've done? Does that make sense now? This is exactly the argument that Paul addresses here and later on in, in Romans. That, that, it, that if I sin, that somehow indirectly God is more glorified, then hey, may I sin more? Or why should I be found guilty? I think ridiculous. By no means, verse 6, then how could God judge the world? But if through my lie God's truth abounds to his glory, why am I still being condemned as a sinner? And why not do evil that good may come as some people slanderously charge us, saying their condemnation is just? This is ridiculous. You know, once in a while, I, um, and it's my final kind of a story, and um, um, once in a while, I encounter a, a new couple, and sometimes this happens not just with new couples, uh, but um, people who have just been in the relationship, but not too long. But they're heading deep into a new relationship. Uh, and they claim that they found their soulmate. And they're thinking about each other all the time. And they really, you know, as they have gotten to know each other, they can't really think of anything that bothers them about the other person. Oh, yeah, I mean, little things, but, yeah, but overall, oh, my gosh. They haven't summered and wintered together, meaning they haven't seen each other at their best and their worst, but they talk individually about a life together, how many kids they'll have, where they'll live, you know, where they'll vacation, and things of that nature. You met people like that, right? It was you, right? <laughs> the people around them who know them realize that they're out of sync a little bit. And they don't quite know each other that well. And during those times, I, I, I have to be a little bit honest with the couple or the individual that I'm talking to. And I ask this question, yeah, you tell me you're in love with this person, but are you really in love with the person? Or are you in love with the idea of being in love? Do you want to really marry this person, spend the rest of your life with this person? And does this person compel you to want to get married? Or have you romanticized the idea of being married for so long, this person, and it could have been a cardboard cutout, really, happened to come along and say, yes, I do. I believe all of us have entered a relationship with a mixture of both. But the problem with falling in love with the idea of falling in love or an imaginary spouse is somewhere along the way, the ugliness of that other person, truth kind of comes through and we have to deal with it. And if you haven't gotten to the point where that person's differences or uniqueness or their, their sinfulness have rubbed us the wrong way, they have their own will and wishes and, and I, I don't like that. If their lives haven't like, kind of crimped your lifestyle, you haven't really known that person. Listen, if the Christian faith has been all just good, if the Bible has never challenged your way of thinking, the decisions that you want to make, if God hasn't ever demanded you to live a life radically differently than the way you feel like you want to live, then you have fallen in love with Christianity, but not Christ. You have fallen in love with the religion of your own imagination, but not a relationship with an almighty God. The bad news is that those of us who are religious, those of us who are functional moralist, Paul says to the immoral, the moral, and the functional moral, the religious, all of us saying the bad news is that in of ourselves, even our greatest religion and morality isn't good enough to save us. The good news, the good news, and this is what Paul is leading to, is that the person of Jesus Christ did for us what no religion can. The person of Jesus Christ did what 
and our morality cannot do. And so he invites us today, and the band will come up at this time. And would you take a minute, especially, especially those of us who've been in the church for a little while, would you take a minute and ask the Holy Spirit to ask you, am I a follower of Christianity or Christ? Do I trust in how good of a Christian I am, or have I trusted in my, in my Lord who has accepted me in my brokenness? Would you take a minute?